God's blessing be on the reading and hearing of our scriptures this morning. Shall we pray? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts find acceptance in your sight. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I didn't have very good history teachers in high school. Uh, one of them was the junior varsity basketball coach. So during basketball season, all it took was one question to him about the game the previous evening, and the period was shot. At the time, I suppose I thought that was, was okay, but in the long run, I discovered that was not the case. Another one was just an uninspired, dull woman. If you didn't think history was dull before you got into the class, you certainly thought it was upon exit. So I grew up, unfortunately, never caring much for the study of history. And that was too bad, because I know I missed a lot of wisdom, a lot of learning, and particularly a lot of insight. Uh, many of us are familiar with that saying, uh, those who, who don't know history or don't remember it are doomed to repeat its mistakes. And I guess that's why it's taken me so long to learn things in life. I had to make so many mistakes myself that I perhaps would not have. In any event, that changed when I got to seminary. I've always been fascinated by the Bible. That the, the Bible, that the, the document or documents that undergird us, that support us, the place that we go to begin figuring out what we believe and how what we believe could and should play out in our lives. I was uh, inclined to believe, even before seminary, that improper use of the Bible or improper understanding of the Bible led to many of the problems in the church and the church in the world. And I kept thinking, if we could just get the Bible right, maybe we could begin to get these other things in the world right. You know how we could live and move and have our being in good and decent ways within ourselves and with our fellow citizens of the community and the world. Um, in the, uh, particularly in, in Methodist traditions, there's a, a technique of looking at the Bible called Scripture, Tradition, Experience, and Reason. Some of you may have heard of that. You begin with Scripture, you read it, and then you look at how the church has used it through the years and its understandings, and then you look at what experiences you as an individual might have had, and then finally at the end, you put it all together in a way that seems reasonable to you, how that scripture speaks to you. The, the, but it always begins with scripture, the words on the page. If we, if we could agree there, perhaps we could begin to find other agreements to start, start our conversation. Well, seminary confirmed for me anyway, that my instincts were right, that proper understanding of the book is key. And I learned that without a proper understanding of history, you're not going to get a proper understanding of the book. Yes, the Bible is a book of timeless truths, of that there is no doubt, but yet it is a contextual document. That is, it was written in specific ways, in specific places, at specific times, in response to very specific incidents. Our New Testament professor used to remind us quite regularly, if you don't understand first century agriculture, that was one he used a lot, if you don't understand how they used to do farming and agriculture in the first century, you won't understand the parables. You had, you had to know the history. So, to really understand Nehemiah, we need to remind ourselves of some history. The books of Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah, they all kind of go together in, in, in one elongated book, were written around the time of the Babylonian exile. Uh, we've talked about this before, when the, the people of Babylon came and uh, conquered the Israelites about 600 years before um, the Christian era. They destroyed the temple, destroyed Jerusalem, they killed a lot of people. They took many people with them back as captives. Particularly, they took the learned people and, and the priests and so on. And they took them back to Babylon, a foreign 
strange land to the people of Israel. And so they were there for a generation or two, some 60 years, until Cyrus the Great of Persia conquered the Babylonians, and he frankly had no interest in the Israelites being in Babylon, so he said, you know what, you all can go home. You go back, rebuild your city, you can worship the way you want, as long as you follow my laws, you know, you, within reason you can live the way you want. The exile was over, and back they went. A time of joy and of celebration and all the rest. Well, in today's reading now, where we come in, all the people are gathered at the temple to hear the priests read the scripture. And they are gathered at the water gate. Now, for someone of my generation that, you know, rung an immediate bell, I've not figured out the connection yet with the Nixon administration, but nonetheless, I just, that always grabs me when I read that section of Nehemiah. They gathered at the water gate. The religious leaders read, and then they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. They gave the sense so the people understood the reading. They were giving sermons. They read the scripture, and then they gave sermons from early morning until midday. And the people responded with amen, amen, and they lifted their hands in celebration. Boy, for future reference, you know, wouldn't that be a great... I'd love to have my sermons responded to that way, but I don't need any, any commentary about how good the sermons have to be before the responses get to be at that level. I, I understand that. But the point is that the people were gathered around and they were thrilled to hear their, their scriptures read, to have the laws under which they had agreed to live. They were listening to them and, and, and it was all recited and so on and so forth. And I'm thinking, this is really odd, is it not? I mean, it's all we can do to sit through a service that's an hour long with a sermon that's maybe 10, 15 minutes. We'll put up with 20 if it's a special occasion, but beyond that. But here these people were thrilled. They were excited. And I'm thinking, how could this be? What was the big deal about standing around the the temple in Jerusalem listening to these these guys, because they were guys, just reading the Scripture and reciting the law. Well, there were two reasons it was exciting to them. and uh, Actually, one follows the other. The first is, because they had been in the Babylon, Babylonian exile for so long, that distant land for a generation or two, they had not been able to, if you will, be at home. They couldn't be in their, in their own barn, to use that expression, you know. They couldn't be in their own temple that sheltered them. They couldn't engage in worship that nurtured them. They couldn't be in a place that comforted them. They couldn't worship in ways where they could be themselves in their own way and in their own time. It's kind of like going on a long trip, a long vacation, and maybe you visit a number of different places and It's all nice, and you enjoy that, and so on. But then at the end, there's just nothing like getting home again, being in your own place. So part of the reason they were willing to stand around and and listen to all this, because it was unique, and it was so special after the, the long exile. And the other reason follows from that, because they were back and because they hadn't been able to do it for so long and and all the rest, it became a holy day, a day of joy for the people of Israel. Nehemiah, speaking for God, says, look, do not mourn or weep. Go your way. Eat and drink sweet wine. That is, enjoy yourselves. Live to the fullest, for this day is a holy day to our Lord. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Joy of the Lord is your strength. Promises had been made to them all during the exile. Promises had been made that God was going to be with them. Very difficult to see when you're living as an alien in a strange land uh, in slavery. But now, with the return to Jerusalem, the promises that had been made so long ago were now promises kept. The word of the Lord had been fulfilled. 
They were back home in their own land to be and to live and to worship in their own way. Yes, they were still under Persian civil law, but religiously, it was far better. And they could live pretty much as they wanted to. We in our country live under certain civil laws for our nation and our state and so on. But yet, we get a lot of latitude in terms of how we can worship. Hopefully allowing other people the freedom to worship you know, as they choose. But that's another topic for another day. There was great cause for rejoicing in their own land, in their own home. The temple had been rebuilt. It was a glorious place to gather, to be in fellowship with one another. It was a glorious place to be, and to gather in fellowship with the creating, saving, sustaining, and fulfilling God. But I've left something out. And I don't know if you noticed it, unless you happen to have the page open to Nehemiah, and we're following very closely as I summarize the ending of Nehemiah's passage. Holy day of celebration. People were encouraged to eat, to drink, to celebrate, to enjoy all the good things. God had provided the joy of the Lord is your strength, he said. But I left something out in the middle. Left something out. In the midst of all the parties, of all the the hoopla and the ballyhoo, comes this. And send portions of food and drink to those for whom nothing is prepared. Nehemiah says, send portions of food and drink to those for whom nothing is prepared. That is, look, celebrate your good fortune. Rejoice that God is with you. Exult that 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 when God makes a promise, God keeps that promise. But then you have an obligation. You are obligated, Nehemiah said, to do for those without, as God did for you when you were without. Send portions of food and drink to those for whom nothing is prepared because this day is holy to our Lord. Nehemiah is saying that, look, out of holiness comes care and generosity toward those who have not. It's not not payback. It's not a guilt offering. It's not kind of a suck your teeth and roll your eyes and think, oh, man, resentfully, I'm obligated to do this. No. It's an act of holiness, a religious gift, a consecrated offering. That is The word fulfilled, says Nehemiah. We haven't even gotten to Luke yet. Luke is the only one, interestingly, with this long section about Jesus in the temple, uh, the, the temple in his hometown, as a matter of fact. One clear confession of the Christian faith, I think, is that the word of God was definitely and definitively fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Is that not the case? One clear confession of our faith is that the Word of God was definitely and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We may not be unclear about everything that comes after that, but that's kind of fundamental. In Jesus, in the Old Testament, it was the restoration of the people to their land and temple that proved God's faithfulness, that fulfilled the promises. In the New Testament, it's the gift of Jesus Christ, God with us, present in real and human form. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's words. God's word. And what were the evidences? What were the signs of God being present so you would know this? How do we know that the word of God has been fulfilled? It's because, says Jesus, you are hearing a very clear message proclaimed that maybe you hadn't heard proclaimed before. And if you read that passage from Luke again, it's not a message about becoming rich. It's not a message about becoming famous. It's not a message about amassing great wealth. It's not a message about having to get storage units filled with stuff because you can't fit stuff into your house. You have to have more room. In Jesus, a clear message is proclaimed. It's a message that brings good news to the poor, proclaims release 
to the captives, memory of sight to the blind, lets the oppressed go free. It's a memory, a, a message that proclaims the year of the Lord's favor. That is, we now are living under God's laws and God's rules and the bounteous gifts of God are for all people. And giving back, as Nehemiah said, you know, okay, God did for you, now you do for others. This is why we do what we do, is it not? This is why uh, the Finance Committee wanted to share with you in some detail today what we as a congregation do in God's name through Jesus Christ. That's why our giving supports not only this building, but any number of special causes throughout the year. Sending young people in, in mission to new places. Providing funds for flood and storm relief, money for scholarships, programs for peace and justice work, and so on and so forth. The Word of God is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's why the choirs come and rehearse week after week after week. And actually, some are in two choirs. That's twice a week, after week, after week. That's why teachers and students show up Sunday after Sunday to learn and to teach each other. That's why the painters come Monday after Monday after Monday. They could be home watching Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy, but they're here painting. That's why each of us, in our own way, we work to proclaim in words and deeds and acts of love that we are in a new day. And we are going to live as if that makes a difference because it does make a difference. The Word of God has been fulfilled and it's fulfilled anew each day when we go forward in concern and service to the community and the world around us. In the name of our resurrected Christ, let us pray. We are grateful, O oh God, not only for the promises you've made to us, but the promises that have been kept and continue to be kept. May we then take these as gifts unto ourselves and bring them out into the world. Help so that all might have your promises to them made and kept and brought to fruition. In the name of our Lord and Savior and guide, Jesus Christ. Amen.